Hi everyone, this is Brian Johnson. Thanks for downloading this episode of Device Talks. I'm really thrilled to be able to bring you this episode today because it was a live panel that we did at our Device Talks Boston event last month and on September 28th. This panel features uh, three of the most interesting and prominent women in the medtech industry. Deborah DeSanzo, she's the general manager of IBM Watson Health. Nancy Briefs, the founder and CEO of Infobionics, as well as many other medical device companies. And Martha Shaden, she's the CEO of Rotation Medical. This panel uh, focused on issues surrounding gender diversity in the corner office of MedTech. It's an issue we've tried uh, hard to bring attention to over the past year on both mass device, medical design and outsourcing, and in our live device talks events where we really have strived to have panels that include both men and women. In this podcast, you'll first hear from Deborah, who's going to make makes brief remarks, and then we bring up the panel for a discussion. I really urge you to listen to uh, the whole discussion. It's it's very enlightening, and I think you'll be surprised by some of the things you hear. And I do hope that while you're listening, you take some time to take a look at our next event, Device Talks West in Newport Beach on December 12th, 2016. We're going to be bringing together some more of the most innovative and influential leaders in the industry to talk about the state of medtech innovation in 2017. So take a look at our website for that event on www.devicetalks.com to learn more. Early rates end on November 7th, so if you want to get a good deal on those, I suggest you act now. And now I'm going to turn it over to our panel. Um, hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm Deborah DeSanzo. I'm the general manager of IBM Watson Health. I'm supposed to give five to ten opening remarks on being a woman in med tech. So I'm going to talk about being a woman in med tech, and I'm also going to be talk about Watson Health, because everybody likes to hear about Watson Health. So five years device talks. I started in medical technology 30 years ago. And anybody remember Apollo Computer? Because we're in Boston. Anybody, anybody work at Apollo Computer? Anybody work? So I started on Apollo, uh, Apollo Computer. I was the product manager for the D- DN2500 workstation. I can't even, you know, if you start to think about that today, it's crazy. But we had a special project at University of Pittsburgh to essentially do telemonitoring in the, in the neuro ORs at University of Pittsburgh. And... Um, it was fascinating, uh, you know, and we saw w- how technology enabled the neurophysiologists to do their work. And Apollo Computer was bought by Hewlett Packard, and I went to the Hewlett Packard Medical Products Group in Andover, Mass. Anyone from HP Medical Products Group all those years ago? So you must have went from Apollo to HP too. Okay, all right, all right. So when I started at HP, which was the medical products group, there were, um, at my level, I was a product manager, there were lots of women. Um, I can now point to one woman who's still in med tech from that, from who I went into HP medical products group with, and there there were lots of us. There were, I remember, two women who were above us. They're no longer in med tech either. And as I progressed through, there were always a few women. And, and now I um, work with one who progressed up through the, the, the thing. So why aren't more women in med tech? You know, in 2002, the amounts of females entering medical school reached the 50% mark. We sell to physicians, we sell to nurses who still are predominantly women. And I also found it, I always found it very simple um, to go in and, and, and understand what the nurses were doing, understand what the physicians were doing, and, you know, was always a believer that our businesses need to mirror what our clients are. So in that, I'm going to talk about the innovation that I've done, and it seems in my life the innovation in med tech has always been done with women. So the first thing I want to talk about is automatic external defibrillators. You know, um, anyone do, anybody from Zoll here? Anyone from Zoll? So you might remember me as a competitor back then. So we, um, I acquired a company called Heartstream in Seattle, Washington. It was founded by five brilliant men. And because we were going up against 
people like physio control in Zoll, we had to really fight hard. The, 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 the people who made a difference for automatic external defibrillators in airplanes and airports were women. I remember them distinctly. The women who ran the flight attendant programs wanted defibrillators in their planes to save the flight attendants. And it was the Chicago O'Hare, whose facility was run by a woman, who was the first airport to put defibrillators in. And, and when I think back of that, it was tremendously, tremendously innovative and done by women. Um, I'm just going to fast forward. All I have ever wanted to do for those 30 years in med tech is make a difference in health and technology. That's all I wanted to do. And you get to a point where you say, is what I'm doing really making a difference to health and technology? And I went on a journey in 2015 to find a place to make a difference. And IBM started calling me. And I thought, oh, I don't want to work for IBM. Anyone work for IBM besides my colleagues here? Oh, I don't want to work for IBM. I already worked for a TV company. Um, and and um, But then... But then Ginny called Health, her moonshot, that the assets that she had assembled in IBM research working on health and cognitive technologies and health were transformative to the world, and Ginny Rometty, who's the chairman of, of IBM, wanted to bring them into healthcare. And I said, well, I should probably go talk to Ginny. And I went and talked, and I still thought, oh, but I want to work for a small startup. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to make a difference in healthcare and technology. And I went into IBM labs and saw the tremendous work that the researchers in IBM research were working on. And I kept saying something like, oh, come on, it doesn't do that. Oh, come on, it doesn't do that. And in fact, it did do that. So I, I joined IBM. And I want to tell you the tremendous opportunity that we have in IBM Watson Health to make a difference in the intersection be, between healthcare and technology is vast, and we will do it. And I'm just going to give you two examples of women who are using Watson Technologies to make a difference. One is Annette Brules at Medtronic. I know there's people from Medtronic here. Annette runs the diabetes group at Medtronic, and Annette had this vision that she could use Watson to make a difference in diabetes care. And in fact, today, Medtronic announced Sugar IQ, which is a Medtronic app now, which diabetes patients will start using, and it's powered by Watson. What we did was we looked at 10,000 patient, patient records of Medtronics in their CareLink database. And Watson found, in analyzing this unstructured data, that we could tell two to four hours before a hypoglycemic patient would have an event. Now, diabetes patients need to make 300 decisions a day. And if they have help by an app called Sugar IQ that helps them make those decisions, it'll make a tremendous impact in their life. And that was Annette Brule's vision, and we're helping her bring it to life. Then I want to talk about clinical trials matching, which we um, invented with Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic has, as many of our, our fine facilities here do, Mayo Clinic has a very large, large breast cancer um, practice. But they weren't getting their patients into breast cancer clinical trials because it takes an incredibly long time to get your patients into clinical trials. You need to analyze the hundreds of pages of electronic health record text, and then you need to match your patients with the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the clinical trials, usually on clinicaltrials.gov. What Watson is able to do is to read the structured and unstructured text in electronic medical record. I just want to say it again. We read the structured and the unstructured text in the electronic medical record. We derive from that the information that's needed for a breast cancer patient for the inclusion and the ex exclusion criteria of the, of the clinical trials. And as Dr. Haddad, who invented this with us at Mayo Clinic, says, and in the next minute, Watson gives me the clinical trials that my patients are, are um, um, included for or excluded for. 
So before we started this project, very few women got into breast cancer clinical trials. And now 50% of all the women, breast cancer patients at, at, at Mayo Clinic, are run through Watson, and a number of those get into clinical trials. And if it was just one, it's more than one, but if it was just one, we made an incredible difference in her life. And again, this was the vision of a woman. So I do think that women make an incredible difference in med tech. We are incredibly entrepreneurial. We understand what our families need. We understand what our, our colleagues need. We can make more of a difference in med tech. And I certainly hope that um, the woman who's standing here 30 years from now doesn't have to say, the women I started with, there's only one that I know today. And with that, with that, I'd like to bring up um, um, Nancy and Martha and, um, and uh, have our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Please have a seat. Nancy, Martha, come join us. I'm Brad Periello. I'm the executive editor here at Mass Device. Want to thank you all for coming and joining us today. And of course, our wonderful panelists. Um, so I thought we could continue the discussion on the importance of women in med tech. Um, serendipitously, uh, leanin.org and McKinsey put out a survey, a big survey they did of 132 companies, 4.6 million employees, and uh, they polled 34,000 employees in addition to that. And there are just a few key points to sort of set the stage for our discussion. For every 100 women promoted to manager, 130 men are promoted. By the time women reach the senior vice president level, they hold only 20% of the line roles from which 90% of CEOs are selected. Women hold 45% of entry level positions, but only 19% of C-suite roles and are only 5% of the Fortune 500 CEOs. So with that, I thought I would start by asking, and Martha, I think I'll start with you, how did you folks enter the industry, and when did it sort of dawn on you that, boy, this is really a, a male-dominated field? So can you all hear me? Uh, good afternoon, and it's a pleasure being here. And thank you, Brian and Brad, for inviting me to be on this panel. And um, this topic, this general topic, is really important to me, uh, not only for myself, but for all the young women, including my daughter, who's 24, and um, paying it, paving the way for them to make it easier and perhaps give them the opportunities that maybe we struggled with earlier in our career. But to get to the answer, I, I got into science because I just love it. Um, you know, I, I had a grandmother who was uh, very, uh, a, she had a beautiful green thumb. Um, my undergrad work was in plant science, and from there it evolved. Um, regarding the question about when did I realize it, um, this is interesting. So I, there were plenty of women, and Deborah, I think, mentioned this. There were plenty of women when I was moving up the ranks, when I was a product manager, a marketing manager, when I was in sales. When I reached the director and VP level, the first time it dawned on me was I was at a management meeting with the CEO, and this was um, about a $750 million business. There were 100 people in the room. These were the managers, I mean the executives in the company. And of the 100, there were two women. It was me and what we called secretary at the time. Um, at that same event, so if that wasn't enough, um, at that second, at that same event, um, the the bonding or um, extracurricular activities, we had a choice of two: paintball or mountain biking up this very steep hill. Um, so I played those paintball games too. Was it? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah you're not going to get me near paintball. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so try running running away from those paintballs in high heels, and it's, and it's not going to happen. So um, that was a wake-up call for me. Nancy, what about you? So I got into medical because I turned down a job from IBM. 
Um, <laughs> I was uh, president of my university in undergraduate, and um, there weren't a lot of women in those types of leadership roles. So I was recruited on the campus, and I had a job offer from Pfizer in New York, IBM and Xerox. And candidly, I was a business student, uh, but my father was an engineer, and I didn't know what to do, and his best friend was a physician. So we were having dinner, and I said, you know, I'm really struggling with what to do, because at the time, you know, Xerox and IBM were, you know, very popular, and, and I thought, well, that should be my career. And he said to me, people are always sick, and you want to make a difference, mm -hmm. so go to Pfizer. So I ended up from a small town in Kansas, in Manhattan in, uh, at, for six months in the training program with Pfizer, and then was assigned a hospital territory for antibiotics for surgery. Back in the days when we actually scrubbed in, if you can remember back that far, some of you in the room. And there, I was recruited by Edwards, which is you know the, one of the leading heart valve companies. And they said to me, we know you're the number two rep in the country, but the reason we're recruiting you is because we have these uh, employment quotas and we need a woman in sales because we don't have any. So I thought that was a real challenge. So I got into the device business after three years in pharmaceutical because they needed me as a statistic. And um, much like your experience, Martha, the first sales meeting, they said, um, you can run a half marathon uh, you can play golf, or we're going to have cigars. And thank goodness I grew up playing golf. So <laughs> I survived. Um, I went on to become the Rookie of the Year, and, and all of the men in my group were so supportive. I have to say that I got off to a really great start, but I was the only woman in a sales force at the time of, I think, about 80 to 100 people. So. Deborah. So you know how I got got into it, but maybe I, I'll just um, I'll just uh, say I'll just say this: when Apollo got purchased by Hewlett Packard, um, Dave and Bill, um, Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett were still running the company at that time, and I had one of these uh, amazing moments. I was sitting in Waltham, Mass, and Bill Hewlett, whose father was a physician, that was why HP was in in medical products. He, he came and sat on the end of my desk and started talking to me about what I did. Now. Um, he did say this to me. Wow, he was the, HP was a, a, a tremendous company for women to come up. But he said, "Wow, so you came from Apollo Computer, and all the other people who came from Apollo Computer were were men. So I'm very happy to talk to you. Please tell me what 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 you're doing." And I told him about the program at, at Apollo Computer. Um, that we were doing, and, and he said, but what are you doing? And I'd say, well, we have this really great networking, so we're, we're networking all these workstations together. And he said, no, but what are you doing? And I said, well, we have really, really very good imaging, so we can see the, the um, EKG images very well. And, and then he started slammed on his desk, and he said, I asked you what you were doing, and I said, well, we're saving lives, to your point of making a difference. And um, Bill Hewlett had this famous thing to say. He used to say, very well, well, then carry on, carry on, carry on, carrying on. And he, he said it to me. But when I was sitting there with my colleagues, there were 50% of the product managers were women. 50% of the product managers were women. And, um, you know, we were doing great things. Yeah. yeah. So what are some of the ways that you've sort of had to consciously accommodate for being a woman in, in such a, a male-dominated field? Nancy, why don't you take that one first? Um, that's a really good question, because um, like Deborah, I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, and I found a couple of things in the beginning were really important. I was started in sales and then moved into marketing and general management. But in sales, because I started as the only woman, I felt it was important from a dress point of view to look like everyone else. I, looking back, I think... I obviously stood out. They knew I was a woman. So I don't know why I thought I had to wear a white button down and a suit everywhere. But um, so I had that accommodation. And the other thing for me, because I traveled a lot, I've done international as well as domestic, was I was very careful not to talk about my family commitments because I was concerned until I'd gotten up past the middle level that they may pigeonhole me in a position where I wouldn't get the tough assignments and I wouldn't get international, which I felt I needed. So 
I think where when we would be socially out and people would be talking about their families and things, I tended to be pretty quiet and I didn't want to talk about that socially. Um, and now that's all I talk about other than my company or my six kids. So, um, you know, it, it's completely reversed. That can change. And I think for women today, it's no longer an issue to talk about your family life um, in the work environment. Deborah, what about you? So are you, I'm going to tell you this, but I, I, hope, I hope this is interesting to the men. I, I think it's probably, I hope it's interesting to the men. Um, in, 2000, in 2001, um, Phillips bought um, Agilent and Hewlett Packard's medical products group. So I became a uh, Phillips employee. And very shortly after there, there was an a analyst day or an investor day in the Netherlands for Phillips Healthcare. And they invited me to come speak. Uh, so I was sitting in the boardroom of Phillips, and, and no one knew me because we had just been acquired, and I was sitting there, and I, um, the CFO, he's no longer there, he, this is 2001, the CFO of, of Phillips Healthcare came in and said, hello, please get me a cup of coffee. And I said, well, I would, I would be very happy to get you a cup of coffee. Could you please show me where the coffee pot is? And he said, well, why don't you know where the coffee pot is? And I said, well, you know, I don't actually work here. I, I am the general manager of the cardi <laughs> cardiac systems business. And he near died. He near died. <laughs> but I'm ha happy to get you a cup of coffee. So, so, that, but, so now let's go forward to the next morning. You know, you've all been at investor days. It's a bit nerve-wracking at the beginning. And we're sitting at a round table like this preparing and it is me, and no problem, but it's me and 30 men. And the head of investor relations for Royal Dutch Phillips stood up and said, and everyone, please let's welcome Deborah DeSanzo. Do you know we invited her because she's a lady, and we've never had a lady speak at Investor Day before. And you know, really, what can you do at this moment but smile <laughs> and say, I'm very pleased to be here. And honestly, in both of those cases, I always took it this way. I always would smile. I would get coffee if people asked. And, and, and I, 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 would, I would take it just with, with joy and laughter that um, this, was, this was how it was. This was how it was. How about you, Martha? So um, I, I share many of the comments that uh, Nancy made. And I've never had anybody ask me to get coffee. So that's a new one, but um, frequently, and this happens to even today, um, and I don't know if, if it's because I'm short or because I'm a woman, but when I'm in a group and somebody meets us for the first time and I'm with my male colleagues, it's always assumed that that male colleague is the CEO. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. So it's... Um, it's, you know, it's an unconscious thing, but it's there. So I don't have much to add except for this. Um, there still exists, I believe, attitudinal biases in the workplace. And what I mean by that is that, and, and there have been studies to show this, that um, employees will react in a different way to the same behavior from a man versus a woman. You know what I mean? So given that, I learned very early in my career that I had to subjugate um, having feelings or displaying feelings in the workplace. So getting mad, mm -mm. can't get angry um, because it would be interpreted because of those attitudinal biases in a different way. Getting too excited, because mm -mm. again, that's that attitudinal bias. So it, 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 it has been difficult as a woman, especially moving up the ranks, to be true to myself, who I am, um, to display you know, authentic leadership yet be able to fit in. So do you feel that you've had to be better than men to succeed at the same level as men? Thank Go. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think that 
you, you have to be good at what you do, right? I mean, it, it, whether you're a man or a fem uh, female, you just have to be good at what you, what you do. You have, to you have to be able to command your, um, the, the, the content and the, and the domain ex you know, expertise. I do think, um, and this is, a, this is another fun fact. So um, I think it was HP that did an internal uh, survey of their employees, and they found that um, women will apply for a job, um, it won't apply for a job um, unless they have 100% of the job requirements. They believe that they have 100%. On the other hand, men will apply for a job if they believe they have at least 60% of the job requirements. And in fact, personally, I have experienced that with young m millennials. Um, and when I've asked them, why aren't you going for that job? Well, I haven't done this or I haven't done that. Sure, you haven't done it, but do you think your male counterpart has done those, have done those things too? So the point of this is that I think that we as women, to move up the ranks, we're overprepared. Um, we, we, we believe we have to be overprepared um, and, you know, be, be A plus on everything to be able to compete effectively. Nancy, what's your take on that? I think my take is a little bit different because I'm now on my sixth startup. So I left the corporate world to do startups. Uh, and there you're really following the money, right? The VCs are looking for people that can give them a return. So I had some early success, and I've been able to do a fair, fair number of liquidity events. And so I think in that case, ironically, it is easier. You have to be prepared. You have to know to, how to do your job. But I think um, because they're looking for the return, I think it's different in corporate America where you're moving up the ranks. Um, I think it's a, probably a different skill set and... Maybe Deborah or others have more experience there. You want to pipe in, Deborah? So I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, but I think that this is what this is what's made a difference. And and if if you can call me successful, what's made a difference is the absolute focus on the patient. Um, Carl Morgan, who was one of the founders of Heartstreams, um, when I showed up, said to me, "I don't know who you are, but I don't like you." and we don't need some hotshot young uh, manager from Hewlett Packard coming here to run our business. But he said to me, but let me give you a piece of advice. Focus on saving lives and the money will come. And not, not because he was the founder of HeartStream and not because Bill Hewlett had told me that a decade ago, a decade before, but because I fundamentally believed it in healthcare. If you focus on what you're doing, if you're focusing on the benefit for the patient or the benefit of the clinician or the benefit for whoever, the radiologist or the cardiologist or whatever you're making, and you focus on what you're doing that shows an impactful difference of saving lives or, or benefiting workflow or, or just giving them time back with his family on the weekend, then the money follows. And I have driven this really hard through my teams. Right, Shalab? Yeah, very, and, and I think that's why the businesses that I've run have been successful. And, and so I don't think that's a man or female thing. It's just a focus on, on what you're doing. Well, so now that all three of you are charged with running different organizations, how do you go about ensuring equitable compensation sort of a, across the board? Nancy, why don't you start? Um, I think at a startup, it's really important in the beginning that you develop uh, a pretty formalized compensation plan because you're going to be bringing in typically people that are very experienced in your sector um, and you know what the salary ranges are. So what I typically do with the board is we build a comp plan for the different levels in the organization, both for uh, cash as well as equity because at startups, you know, equity is really the driver for most of us. And so when we bring people in, it's easier to make sure that it's equitable. And um, I think I have had a good track record of that. My current company is 40% women, and we have uh, three in the C-suite. 
And it's not because I was looking for them, but they had the right experience, and they knew when they came in they'd get the same comp for an equity for their work. Deborah, how do you go about ensuring equitable compensation? You, you know, Watson Health 18 months ago had three employees and today has 7,000. And I can absolutely tell you that there is equity across um, genders between them. Why is that? Well, one is because I got to, one, hire my executive team, which is also 40% women. I also didn't look for women, but but there's there's there is a bias that comes in. You do like to... I also like to hire people who are like me. And, and, and that, that bias does come in. It comes in for men, and it comes in for women as well. Um, and then, as we acquired companies, we get to look, as the acquired companies are coming in, what is the balance? Now, interestingly, we've acquired mostly startups. And in the startups, there is much more balance mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and, and equity between um, what women are being paid and what men are being paid. So for the most part, those startups um, were also balanced. The only Why do you think that is? Sorry, I was loud, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the sorry only place there we wasn't a you. balance was in the, the IBM researchers that came over, and then I just adjusted their salaries to make it equitable. I don't know why do you think there's more of a buy there's more of a balance in startups than there is. I think it's it because it's it's too it, it's more difficult to hide it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more transparent. Um, they're generally much smaller organizations. There's not as many and layers. Transparency is key. When you exactly. look at it, you can change it. Exactly. And you, you need to have the will to change it. But when you look at it, if you can exactly. see it, you can change it. Yeah, right. I agree. Yeah. No, I I think that's definitely it. Plus. Most people going to startups are looking for equity and ownership. That's right. And mm -hmm. so uh, they're pretty savvy, too, about comp in the industry. Yeah. And, and it's transparent. Yeah. Yeah. So taking it to a, a maybe a little higher level, why is it important to have women in med tech? And what are the implications of not having enough women in key positions? Martha, you can start. So I think, um, you know, it, it, it is an issue of having, a, a, the it is important to have more women, but I think fundamentally it's more, Im it's, it's important to have divergence of thought, right? Um, so whether it's women versus men or it's, you know, different um, people from all over the world, you know, international um, as well as domestic on your team, I think it's really about creating a very um, divergent group, uh, uh, a divergent thinking in, in the organization. But there, it is, it is true that if you have more women in leadership roles, um, organizations tend to be more creative, more innovative, more inclusive. Um, retention is better, um, and so there's. I think. Part of that is just the divergence in thinking. And I also think just because of, you know, and this is a generalization, but women tend to be consensus builders. And when you're consensus builders, I think that people feel ownership and their creative juices get going in a different way. And I think it results in better creativity coming out of the organization. Nancy? Um, there was an interesting uh, study by Dow Jones from 1997 to 2011, and they looked at 20,000 venture-backed companies, and they found that the teams that were the most inclusive across the board had superior performance. Mm -hmm. So if you just look at the statistics, it says the more inclusive the team, the better their performance. And... Um, I think you know performance at the end of the day in the business is what we're all driving for. So I think it makes sense. And I find, like Martha, the more inclusive, the more different thoughts that you get, um, and you almost build your own, as we call it, our tribe. You know, we all have the same mission, and we like to say uh, teamwork makes the dream work, and we all have the same dream. And and I think that performance and the focus on certain things is really important. Mm -hmm. Deborah, anything? Yeah, to add? I, I absolutely agree with Martha and Nancy. Diversity is important. Diversity of, of thought is important. Um, and I do meet an awful lot of women 
med tech entrepreneurs doing extraordinary things. I don't know why. I'm on Jane Chen's board. She made an um, incubator for babies in emerging markets. Tracy Roche made is out in um, Watertown doing, doing um, um, uh, extracting information from um, patient monitors. These these two women. And when I, t I mean, I, I didn't make that up. The beginning of Watson Health, Watson for Oncology, came out of two women, a, 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 a woman oncologist out of Memorial Sloan Kettering and a woman oncologist out of MD Anderson. Clinical Trials Matching is a woman. The first diabetes app is a woman. There's something, there's something in diversity of thought that you want to include. You want to have as much diversity of thought so you can be as innovative and solve the world's problems as important. So it's not so much about... Um, as both of my colleagues said, women and men, but you just want diversity and you want to drive it so that you get the innovation and, and you can make a difference. And so to wrap things up, what are support systems out there, are there for women, and you know, how, is it, how important is it for them to take advantage of those? Martha, please go ahead. Yeah, um, so there are many, many, many um, networking organizations. I'll just highlight one. Um, so Avamed. Um, last year, I initiated um, a women's executive network group. It's called WEN, and they've done some tremendously uh, wonderful things for women to bring them together to help them to network and to, um, you know, talk together about some of the challenges facing them. And if you're not part of Avamed or you're part of Avamed and not part of WEN, I would highly encourage you to to um, look into it. Um, <clears throat> I think that, and I'll just go off on a tangent here, I think that networking for women is a hard thing to do. You know, when you think about the, uh, the powers in an organization, right, there's positional power and then there's content power or, or expertise power, and then there's influence power. And that's all about creating relationships and networking, and what I think women tend to do is we focus on building our content power and we understand that the influence power is important uh, but we don't spend as much time on it. We keep our heads down, we execute brilliantly as Nancy has, and Nancy and Deborah have talked about and, and um, we forget about that influence power. But the other thing is, is that um, you know, I, I also believe that there's a difference between networking and having um, a mentor versus someone who's going to be a sponsor. And if the higher you go in an organization, I think women may have mentors, but I think as you go up in an organization, that sponsor, sponsorship is missing. What I mean by that is someone who's really going to advocate for you. And the sponsor is in a position to help you move in that organization. And I think that's what's lacking. So getting out there and networking with WEN and other organizations um, is really important not only to um, understand what's available, but also to seek out and identify sponsors that could be important to your career trajectory. Nancy? Um, for those of you, I'm assuming all of us here live in this part of New England, there's also a great group here in Cambridge that's called WEST, Women in Engineering Science and Technology. And so it tends to be a lot of people that came up through academia in science and technology and often want to move to industry. Uh, and also there's the Healthcare Business Women's Group, which is uh, very active here locally. And unlike Martha, I guess because I love to talk and network, I network all the time, so many of you in the room know me. Um, I think it's um, really important. And I try every year to mentor two women that are early in their careers So um, and can't sponsor them because they're not in my organization. But I think it's important to pay it forward uh, because people help me uh, along the way as well. Deborah, I'll give you the last word. 
Tom, do you still have your women's networking group going on? MassMedic. Um, how many? How many oh, yeah. of you are, are members of MassMedic? Um, it's a fabulous women's right. network. So, so, so join that. And I'm going to echo um, any anyone, whether you're a man or a woman. Um, networking is so important. You meet su such cool people, and and I, some men are, some men don't like to network either. But you meet so such amazing people and great. Business ideas come from that network. Secondly, I believe in the power of a mentor. Everyone should have a mentor in your organization. And as you move up, um, get yourself a management coach as well because you need someone who's going to tell you what you're doing well, what you're not doing well. And it really helps to have some, sometimes a mentor doesn't feel comfortable doing that. So we all have to improve all the time. So network, mentor, management coach. On that note, how about a nice round of applause for our great panelists?